But we've just done a prep where you've taken a coil, a galvanometer and a magnet and you've waved that or moved that magnet in reference or in relation to the coil. And you notice that as the magnet goes in, what happens to the coil, to the, to the current? It moves to one direction. Okay. Then when you hold the coil, um, sorry, the magnet still in the coil, what happens to the current? It stops. When you remove the coil, sorry, the, cut the magnet from the coil, from the tubes, and we remove it, what happens to the current direction? It's in the opposite direction. So we know that if it was a north pole going in, it goes one way, and then the, when the north pole is removed, it goes the opposite way. Then we discovered that if we turned the coil upside down and did it from the other end, everything reverses. So it's not just simply the current going in, sorry, the magnet going in, or what pole the magnet is going in, but it's also the end of the, um, of the coil is important as well. Did we do the following? Um, we probably, we'll just pop over to this one over here. Um, take your magnet, which looks like a really big board. I want you to put the magnet in and hold it still in the centre. Does not matter what pole? Does not matter what pole. Okay, what happens at this moment? What's the magnet's? Uh, the galvanometer reading yeah. zero. Okay, why is it not having? Why is it not reading anything? It's not moving anything. Right, there's no change of flux. The magnetic field is stationary. Oh, oh keep on. I just hold that there. Okay, got it. Now, just rotate it. Just move, move the coil, uh, the, the magnet inside the coil in a circular motion, just slightly. What's happening to your um, current? It's going slightly. Moving. Right, it's not. Is it, is it as big as when it came in or going out? No. No. So what can you tell me about the change of magnetic field that must be happening when we take the bore and we're moving inside the bore? So in other words, here is the coil and there's the wiring. But we're now taking the magnet and we're putting it inside here and we're moving it in a circular motion inside. What's the change of flux like? Right, it's only smaller, that's and we know it's smaller because what's not being generated as much? Current. Current, good, excellent. Okay. So this is not just a way of um, detecting uh, or making electricity, but it's also a way of detecting the change of flux, isn't it? That by the amount of electricity that is being created. Now, we're starting off with this one for a few moments. This is Faraday's law, as we discovered last time. This is the easier one to remember. It's the one I remember whenever I need to quote it to you. And um, this one is a bit more modern uh, version than the language that Faraday himself used, which was much more polished and couched a lot of it in mathematics. So it says, a conductor in the presence of a changing magnetic field will have induced in it an EMF. If a circuit is provided, then current will flow. Now that's just like the motor effect. There are two parts to this. The first part you normally quote all the time, and the second part you quote for a, a much a deeper answering, um, a much greater explanations of things. So always quote: a conductor in the presence of a changing magnetic field will experience, um, will have induced within it an EMF. If a circuit is provided, then current will flow. So you memorise that. Then part two is to do with what is it about this flux. The faster the change of the magnetic field, in other words, the ch faster the change of flux, and that many people actually write change in flux, because it's quicker and easier, the greater the current or the EMF induced the conductor. And that's what we discovered today, wasn't it? If we move that magnet much faster in reference to the coil, then we will have a greater change in flux, therefore greater current. You okay with that? Okay. Right. So, just remembering that we've got the induced current in the coil is equal to the rate of change of flux in the coil. That's what Faraday said. So um, it's actually proportional to it, but we make it quality. And we're about to look at Faraday's law of induction, which is a mathematical version of it. And we've now, in our mathematics, done enough to understand the symbology which we see here, the symbolism 
of this. Okay. So let's just quickly before we go and fill in all these, I will, this will enlarge itself so you don't have to worry too much about it. In this formula here, this curly little E, also known as epsilon, is E of F. So that will be the E of F in a few moments. Define with a T, we've done enough calculus in your two unit and three unit and some of you four unit mathematics to know that if phi is flux, then the phi by the t is the rate of change of flux. You've all done rates of change, okay? Um, so that's the phi by the t. It's also in, it could be d phi by the t, and remember the delta means over a bigger period of time. The little d means in an infinitesimal period of time. So it's just a rate of change of flux, or how quick the, ch uh, the flux is changing. So this represents how quick the flux is changing. The last part, there is two more pieces here. This n is the number of turns in the coil. And we've seen this n before. Where was it also used in another formula? In our torque formula, wasn't it? The number of coils all have been, um, interacting together and they, just, they sum together. And finally, this minus, and this is the reason why and we spent an entire section of this course looking at this as to why that is a minus sign. That's, you should have realised that when you put something into a coil, it goes one way, and then as you pull it out, it goes the exact opposite. What is happening is the entire universe is trying to balance the conservation of energy. So whenever you put um, energy in, the coil goes, um, the current of the coil goes one way to try and counter your, the energy, the kinetic energy that you are using to make the electrons move. For the magnet. And when you pull it out, the electrons try to go the other way, and so therefore the magnetic flux changes to try and, sorry, the current changes to try and remove um, the fact that you have um, too much energy. Okay? It's just it's a conservation of energy. And, I will just say it now, it's called Lenz's Law. Okay? But we'll get there when we get there. I just don't want to spend ages talking about it right now. So, let's go in first. Actually, just going back first to this one here. This is Faraday's law as he spoke it. The induced EMF in a coil is equal to the rate of change of flux through the coil. Um, he is slightly incorrect in saying it's equal to it. It's equal to it multiplied by the number of coils. Okay, so the sum, when we say the coil, he was talking about a single coil. Okay. So, just making sure that we can we understand each part of this. As we said a few moments ago, the epsilon is this. So, is um, the electromotive force and this is the force that has potential to make electrons move. Okay. Does it make electrons move? No. It just pushes, like you're pushing on a wall. The wall will not move unless there is some ability for the wall to move. So the only time an electron can move in a circuit is if there is a circuit. So even though the electrons actually are pushed, Unless a circuit is provided, current will not flow. So once we have current, it means a circuit must have been provided. Are we okay with that one? Oh, undo, where's my undo? Control Z. <coughs> okay, the next part was, uh, is the N. And I've just explained a few moments ago what N is. N is the number of turns in the coil. So when Faraday was formulating his law, which says it equals the chat rate of change, he was saying for a single coil. We now know it's proportional to the number of coils. So each coil has an induced EMF in it, and they all add together. And if you've got N coils, you increase your um, rate of flux through each coil by a factor of N. I'll say that again because it sounded a bit wrong. If I've got n coils and each of them have a certain amount of flux, 
So if I've got two coils and they both have a flux of five, that means there's 10. Um, so therefore you double the amount of flux overall, even though you haven't actually doubled the or changed the flux in any way. I'm hoping that makes sense. Right, yeah. Can I move on to the next one? Um, starting over here, as I mentioned, this is a very important part of the... Um, it's not actually mentioned in Faraday's law himself when he said EMF is equal to the rate of change of flux. It's been added later for completion. And the negative side is because of the conservation of energy. If we put in energy into a system and you get free energy out, then the universe would suddenly, um, there would, would be conservation of energy. So from a very small amount of input of energy, we have an increase, and that increase could cause a further increase. So we can't have free energy. And to stop this, or um, to take into account that the, um, there's no free energy in the system, we have to put a minus sign here. And it indicates that the EMF is going to go against the magnetic field that induces it. It's going to try to oppose it. Laser's law is a very effective law and it has a lot of applications and we'll go through it later on. Okay? So the negative side indicates the EMF is directed against the, field, the magnetic field that it's creating it and this is called Menzer's law. Okay? Notice the lens is of the Z and it's apostrophe S. Okay? Not lenses as in your eye lenses for your spectacles and glasses. Okay? Don't know. I've seen it done. Okay, now, the fibrivity. It's the rate of change of flux over time. In a few more moments, you're going to be designing a prac, um, which is going to be three different pracs. Okay? And you are going to have to come up with a way of changing the flux through the coil so that you can actually measure it. So, if the fibrivity is the rate of change of flux, how can we change this? Um, the, the rate of change of flux. And here are three possible ways, not the only three possible ways. We can increase the strength of the magnetic field in which the coil is situated. So using a stronger magnet and moving that stronger magnet at the same speed would give you a greater um, ability to change the flux. Because if you start with a flux of five, Then it changes down to zero, and it changes to minus five, because you're pulling it, pushing a magnet in with five, calling it to stop, and then pulling it out. Is everyone happy that I'm using these numbers? So this is flux. When it goes in, you change it by five, you hold it still at zero, and then you pull the flux out in the other direction, the magnet out in the other direction to minus five. What's the change of flux? The change of flux all over is? 10 levels. Okay. Imagine you use a stronger magnet, and the stronger magnet starts with 10 going in. You hold it steady, then you pull it out. How many um, Weber's change this time? It's a 20 change of Weber. Um, so which of these has a greater change of flux? Right, the second one. So using stronger magnets and ma moving them in reference to your coil is one way of changing the flux with greater speed. Okay. Second, the area of the coil exposed to the field. Now there's one group that was using a really, really small coil and we couldn't do anything with it. So just take a look at this coil here. This is not the lowest, this is one for your okay, let's just hold it. Like that. Now this coil here has a very small bore down the centre and as a result we can't get the magnet into the coil. Okay, I've got to use a really thin magnet if I can find one. So the only thing we can do with the magnet is put the magnet into the mouth and not into the actual coil. Okay? So if I was to be able to have a, a wider bore I could put the, current, uh, the magnet much deeper into this coil. 
So the area of the coil that gets exposed to the change of magnetic field means that we can have a greater current. Okay. So that's the reason why I've made sure that all the, um, the coils that you are using, the magnets can actually fit in the bore. Are we okay with the word bore that I'm using? B-O-R-E, as in the hole in the center. Okay. And finally, the faster the change in field lines, the quicker we do this movement, the quicker we put the, the magnet in and out. So the first magnet, if we take it up here, was a five Tesla magnet. It goes in, zero, minus five, and remove it. That is 10 Weber change. The second was a stronger magnet, it was 20 weight of change. But if this one here, the top magnet, was done at four times the speed, then the one on the bottom, that was only done twice, they'll produce the same amount of electricity. Because EMF is equal to the change of thigh over time. In the top one here, the change, delta thigh, change of thigh is equal to 10. And the second one here, the change of thigh is equal to 20. Okay? But if I do it quicker, that though this has a change of thigh which is 20, and this one has a change of thigh which is 10, I could use the lower change to create just, as amount, about, just the same amount of, of um, current. Okay? So if I was to take the 10 and do it in, a, um, in say, four seconds, um, I would get uh, 2.5 um, volts, which is, say, in this volts. That's for the first one. Or I could have used 20, and I've done that in, um, let's do that in eight seconds, and I still get 2.5 volts. I do this in a much slower change, I get the same result. So these are three different ways we can make the current be greater. Obviously, we just don't do one of them. We try to do as much as we possibly can. We do two, especially number three and number one. We use strong magnets and we move them quickly. Okay. Number two is especially good as a design for the way that we use a generator and the way we, we change the area of the coil, expose the magnets is we spin the coil between the magnets. And that makes the change very, very quick, very, very rapidly. Okay? Okay. 